Hello, how are you? Prezados, boa noite. We are here uh, with François Hacord. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, too much stuff. And I would like to say a few words in Portuguese too, but all the interview will be in English. And then, uh, quero agradecer a todos por estarem aqui, estarem nos acompanhando. É, a entrevista vai ser em inglês. Estamos começando essa temporada 2022 da revista Tema Livre Hoje. Esse ano que é muito especial para a gente, que nós vamos fazer aqui 20 anos. Well, um, first of all, I would, I would like to thank you to be here with us. I'm glad to start 2000 is to start this year with uh, talking with you. Yes, I'm glad of that. And to be in Rio with you tonight, tonight for me. Yes, afternoon here. And well, to start, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how did your interest in history uh, appear and about uh, intellectual history started? Also, I would like to know uh, how about Greeks? How it uh, how did it appear for you as a field of study? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, my interest for history was not at the beginning for let's say general history or for. Uh, methodology or for theory of history, but rather um, the beginning was with uh, ancient history. And uh, in this very specific context, it was um, in the 1970s. And um, I was at that moment uh, very much disappointed by the afterwards, the aftermath of 1968. And um, I was rather uh, uh, inclined to, to put my interest in the ancient world rather than in the contemporary world because I was, as we were many of us at that moment, rather disappointed by the recent events. And at that moment, I met uh, Jean-Pierre Vernon and uh, Pierre vidal naquet and uh, these people were uh, offering a new approach to the ancient world. Uh, that means that they were uh, very much, uh, they disagree very much with the traditional um, traditional humanism of the Sorbonne. And they thought that uh, the Greeks could be, as we said at that moment, um, uh, following, in a way, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, the Greeks were, at that moment, good to think. That means that they were not models or whatever, but with them, with the ancient democracy, with the ancient mythology, with the ancient religion, you could uh, raise issues which were which were also interesting for your own world, your own time, as, a, as a, an anthropologist. Exactly as an anthropologist. You, you don't go to a remote uh, country or to a... Re as Levi Strauss in, the, uh, I, in Brazil, but you... Uh, with the Namiquara, but you visit the Greeks and of course, the Nambiquara, the Nambiquara, and the Greeks are not the same. 
but you, your general attitude, the general um, questioning could be similar. And that was this approach which interested me and which interested us, a small group of people at that moment. And um, um, that was the, what we call at that time uh, historical anthropology. Okay. And when I start to work, I decide to work on Herodotus and to write my dissertation on uh, Herodotus. And the, the first, very first question I was uh, interested in was Greeks and the others, this question of alterity, uh, and uh, which was uh, in the, a, a question largely debated in the 70s. Because as it was in the field of anthropology, and uh, uh, I, I, and in a way, I start to read Herodotus as uh, Michel de Certeau. I don't know. You see, uh, who is Michel de Certeau? Um, as Michel de Certeau read Jean de Léry. I, uh, about to, about Brazil, about Brazil, and at a, so Herodotus was for me also some kind of anthropologist in the ancient world. But it, he was not only that. He was in the Western tradition. He was presented from the very time of. Uh, Cicero, he, he was presented as the father of history, and and uh, the I was interested in this dimension. What does that mean to be the father of history, and to be at the same time uh, presented as a liar, someone who narrates uh, fabulous incredible things, incredible stories. So how could you be the father of history and also a liar? And that's what one of the problematic I was working with uh, in my in my book. And, and the third dimension with the religious was the more general question of the reception of antiquity along the centuries up to the modern times. And, and um, you have, just to say one thing uh, uh, about that, uh, you have this kind of this um, position between Herodotus and Thucydides, which uh, was very much, um, um, and the, the emphasis on this difference was put especially during the 19th century and especially by the Germans, the um, German philologists or German ancient historians, because that's what Herodotus was still not a real historian. And to see this, with to see this, you had the real beginning of true history. And the, so I was interest, interested um, in uh, trying to understand how this um, couple, uh, Herodotus to Kilides, was built along the centuries and up to the present to the present time. So that was my my beginning <laughs> in the field. So you see, ancient history. But with ancient history, you have all the anthropological uh, dimension and reception of antiquity and historiography. 
When uh, Le Région de Historicité was published, we already, we, we were already living in a society too much uh, focused on the present. So today, 20 years later, uh, how this relationship uh, with the present, how can we look to this relationship? How should you look to this, to, to, to the to, to 20, 20 through the view of the regime, the regime de historicité? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Uh, perhaps first, it's better to say a few words about the, the concept of regimes of historicity itself and how uh, I start to um, build this, uh, this concept. Because before to arrive to presentism, to arrive to presentism, you need to have the instrument that is the concept of regime of historicity. And, and I, it might be interesting to for for your uh, for the audience um, to 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 know that the regime of history, the very beginning for me of the uh, idea of regime of historicity came from the reading of an, another uh, anthropologist, an American one. Uh, Marshall Salins. Marshall Salins, an American anthropologist who died uh, last year, and who was a specialist of the um, Pacific uh, area and a special, specialist of Polynesian uh, people, people from Polynesia. And, and uh, he wrote a book, um, the title of which is Islands of History, Islands of History. And it is uh, dealing with uh, Hawaii, Hawaii and New Zealand with uh, Maori, Maori people. And the title of the book itself is very telling because when he says, when he, write, when he writes Islands of History, that means that these islands were not only in history, and you have the, the old debate about the people, uh, primitive people without history or outside of history or primitive who are backward and who ignores what, what is history properly. So you have all these debates very much uh, uh, present alive still in the 60s, in the 50s and the 60s. And um, when you say islands of, of history, that means that these islands have also the capacity of producing their own history. That means not the Western one, but a different one, and but a real, history and and um, uh, silence uh, defines the the regime of historicity if he does not use uh, the, the concept but uh, that's uh, my reading of it of him uh, they have what he calls uh, an heroical regime of historicity because the only one who is doing history who is making history is the king, and and uh, um, or the, the, they don't uh, uh, put uh, an emphasis, or let's say they don't have the modern Western uh, divide between present and past, which is starting point of modern history they have something which is different the past is uh, so to speak reabsorbed in the present 
So you don't have this sharp cut between the two. So that's a the relation to time, to time are very different from the Western, modern Western one. And, and in a way, Marshall Salins was uh, uh, following and, and going further, following Levi Strauss and going further than Levi Strauss. And you know, of course, this very famous distinction proposed by Levi Strauss in the 60s about the cold and the hot societies uh, and which is which means that you have some history which are which made history the in engine of their uh, of their uh, becoming and other other society don't but all of the all the societies are equally in history. So with uh, this uh, proposition by silence following Levi Strauss, I have this idea idea of different types of history, different types of relation to time to time, uh, different ways of organ of um, articulating the categories of past, present and future. And the regime of historicity is precisely that. That means the way in which a society at a certain moment articulates the relations between the three categories. And if the past is predominant, that means that you have what in what I what I call the ancient regime of historicity. That means that when you want to understand what is happening in your present you start by looking backward in direction of the past in order to find precedents examples and uh, you practice imitation if on the other side the future is the main category that means that you look first in direction of the future in order to understand the present and the past and that's a modern regime of historicity corresponding with corresponding to the modern time uh, time with time of the as a process first time uh, embedded with progress and and uh, if that's no longer the past and no, no, neither the past nor the future, which are the main categories, remain the present. And that we arrive at presentism. And, I, and we, in the, in the 70s of the 20th century, in Europe, start a modification in our relation to time the future which has been had been the main category of the modern times of the progress of eman emancipation of but also of uh, mass destruction of of uh, world war uh, world wars the future was uh, losing its uh, predominance, was losing its, its appeal, its strength. And, and uh, uh, that was the moment where, when uh, the present became more and more important or even uh, seem to appear as the only one category, so to speak, uh, putting the past in a way, uh, kicking out the past and kicking out the future, and remains only the present. And that was that's very schematical, of course, what I'm saying right now. But that's to give the, the general idea. 
and and um, uh, the world in the the last part of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century um, became very presentist, I think. And uh, but we discovered too that presentism is itself. Um, you have many kinds of presentism. There is, you, are, you don't have only one presentism, but we discover that uh, you have, so to speak, the winners of presentism, the people who are uh, very flexible, agile, who are able to uh, move very fast and always faster um, to adapt. Uh, and you have the losers of presentism, uh, people who are um, disemployed, who are uh, more or less, uh, who are not allowed to have any project, right? Because they live from one day to the next. And um, in our societies, um we have for example many young people who don't have jobs and who seem for them the future is is not an opening and uh, so that's uh, from you have the very flexible people uh, moving faster and faster uh, from one job to another one job to one place from another place and on the other way on the other side you have people who are uh, uh, stuck so to speak at, at the same the same position at the same place and without uh, any um, perspective um, and, and uh, perhaps I can go on, but perhaps you have an ex another question. Mm -hmm. What do you think in aspects uh, positives and negatives of the present? And also, uh, if you we can, if you we could, for example, uh, with can what the, the main benefits and damages of this intense intense relationship with the present uh, how it can uh, be bad or good to a society and also who do you create a kind of ranking uh, of the region the historicity could exist for example a region more merciful or cruel to a society Yes, we discover, I mean, at the beginning, uh, in Europe at least, um, the present, uh, the category of the present was uh, looked at as, as very positive. It was, you have to live not only with your time, but to live in the present. And the present itself, the world, the, was positive and uh, for example in the uh, um, uh, advertisement you have uh, uh, emphasis put on this where the present so but we also discover that presentism was as many negative uh, features and uh, i i just presented some of them with my um, division between the winner and the loser of presentism. And, and um, but perhaps now the main uh, limitation of presentism is because we in, 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 in,
um, the, the age of Anthropocene or the age of um, uh, new planetary uh, uh, age because of the uh, uh, global warming and the climate change and and uh, the presentism is absolutely unable to take into account duration to take into account um, the enormous uh, uh, lengths of times of times which are the temporalities of the earth and the temporalities of the uh, climate so we are in a way um, in a small uh, uh, small very small world of presentism and confronted to in great periods of time, great length of times, with we and these new um, dimensions, we have to take them into account, and we are more or less unable to do that. And I think that we have new, uh, we are put into new. Uh, uh, conflicts, uh, temporal conflicts, uh, which, with which we are very, very uh, unfamiliar. And how Does about, it work? Uh, Is it okay? Oh, because sorry, I, because I, 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 my, my internet had some problems, but okay. Uh, okay. It's okay. So, could I go to the next one? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I would like to know uh, if the academic research, they already live under the hoods of the present years. And also, how should researchers act in a presentist world? And what kind of research do you think that the that should be done and given to society? Well, mm, of course, I am. I don't. I don't see the whole uh, uh, panel of uh, research done. But I think perhaps the first observation is that <coughs> it took time <coughs> for historians and also for, uh, let's say, social scientist to become aware of the new temporal conjuncture uh, of this presentist moment uh, and the especially perhaps for the historians because they they deal with time but they use, they have a very <coughs> instrumental use of time through chronology <coughs> and uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> and their re reactions to this uh, new conjuncture uh, was. The, de the development of uh, memor 
memory studies. Because <coughs> the, with presentism came also memory. And we had this great um, surge and of memory, of uh, look for memory, or uh, for uh, um, right to memory, or duty of memory in the, during the last uh, part of the 19th century, of the 20th century. And, and um, so the historians, many historians, uh, became uh, busy with uh, memory and they uh, start to develop um, a uh, history of memory or to do history of memory. Um, also, um, with the development of memory, in Europe, but not past, not only in Europe. Uh, and in Europe, it was of, at the beginning because of the um, of the um, following of the extermination of the Jews. But um, in uh, South America, it was for other reasons. And after the dictatorships and uh, um, um, authoritarian regimes and uh, so this need of, of memory and trans transitional justice and all these things. So the figure of the victims uh, became prim prominent. Uh, so the historians were busy also in, in that in this field memory, victims, um, slavery, of course, but also uh, post-colonial history. And, and finally, uh, and gender, of course, also, um, minorities, and finally, globalization. And global history, which was a big issue in the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, global history, which was a way to um, to uh, put an end uh, to previous uh, national histories or imperial histories or all these um, uh, Western uh, invention um, which were l linked to what I call the modern regime of historicity. Because uh, national, great national history, um, histories were written in a teleological way. That means that the, uh, the end uh, the uh, telos, the end, uh, uh, indicates the way in which you write history. So you move from the uh, the end, uh, the, the realization of the nation, for, for example, back to the beginning of the nation. And but you know exactly what you have to write. What is important. And all imperial history histories also were written according to the same pattern. And uh, in and so they were busy in all these uh, things, these new fields or these new questions. But uh, they were not uh, still. Um, they, do not, they, they, they did not know what to do with presentism. And more recently, they, 
until recently. They did not know what to do with new issues I was alluding to just a few minutes ago. Um, that means the, with the introduction of these new temporalities coming from the, the Earth and the uh, Anthropocene. So I think that um, the historians, I speak mostly for the historians, the historians remain um, uh, attached uh, or preoccupied by <clears throat> the, the world and the temporalities of the world, the different temporalities of the world through all these topics I enumerate just a few minutes ago. But now I think we have to take into account, as I said, this other dimension, this new dimension, which we cannot take only into account the different, the different temporalities of the world. We have to take into account the extra temporalities uh, of, the, uh, of the universe itself, of the earth itself, because we are part of the of this uh, system, of this earth, uh, uh, of this world, of this new world, so to speak. And uh, is there any perspective to the end of the present? Yes. And speculating if the presidents fall down all the region uh, which region could uh, would enter uh, a region oriented to the future or to the past <clears throat> well um is there any perspective of the end of presentism? Um, of course, I have not the answer, but uh, we at least we we can make few uh, observations. First, um, these new dimensions we have it to take into account because the, in this new uh, conjuncture, general conjuncture, um, obliges us. I, and when I say us, I say the uh, the humans uh, obliges us to uh, look beyond presentism if we want to be able to to take care of this, this situation or to try to take care of the situation. And before to take care, we have to become aware of. And as you know, you have seen many people who are not aware or who don't want to be aware of the situation. I don't think that uh, around your presidents, uh, they are very much aware uh, of the situation. Uh, <clears throat> That's the first observation. Second observation, presentism is still very strong because now of the technology, because of the um, world, the digital, digital world in which we are. Uh, and more and more digital um, with um, the big, uh, the GAFAM, um, which are very uh, active in our everyday life. Um, so, presentism is uh, 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 reinforced, is uh, uh, more, more active, more intrusive in our everyday life because of that. And that means that 
the contradiction between this digital world or digital, so to put, in a way we are, uh, our condition is a digital condition. And the question is how to uh, transform or to um, uh, transform the uh, our digital condition in a new historical condition. And to move from the digital to the historical, I think that by being able precisely of um, going beyond presentism and being able to take into account and to deal with uh, all these new temporal dimensions which are heterogeneous. So uh, that's my take on observation. Uh, and the, the third, perhaps, observation, <coughs> following uh, what I have said, uh, is that you have a lot of people around the world who are dissatisfied with presentism and who uh, try to escape from presentism. In, and even if they are not very conscious of this uh, um, uh, dimension, because they, in a way, they were uh, they were born in presentism, so they did not know another regime uh, of historicity, so to speak, in their own life. But they are dissatisfied, and they try. They are looking for something different, and they are looking for uh, another other rhythm of life, uh, other kind of jobs, uh, other, uh, <clears throat> in general, slowing of their uh, everyday life. And, and um, I don't know up to what point these uh, decisions, uh, which are quite often individual decisions, uh, will go but <clears throat> but um, uh, it could play it's for, it could play an important role in uh, um, putting into question the uh, strengths of presentism <clears throat> and Ish, i would like to ask you about your new book Kronos, could you tell us a little bit? Yes. <clears throat> um, Kronos is, uh, Kronos, of course, is the name of time in Greek. Um, and and uh, the subtitle of the book is uh, the West confronts time. And that, that uh, the book is a genealogy of Western time. Or, but not, that's not an history of time. That's a genealogy of what something which became Western time. And, and, uh, <clears throat> Why Kronos? Because, in a way, the story starts with the Greeks. Um, and the way in which the Greeks define, uh, or the vocabulary they use in order to try to, not to think time, but at least to have a grasp on time. And, and um, because Kronos is, by definition, the evanescent, uh, uh, imp impossible to uh, stop it, to uh, handle it, to master it, to uh, win. Again, you don't win against time. But uh, every society, uh, 
from the very beginning, I think, uh, <clears throat> try to <clears throat> have some kind of grasp on time. And the Greeks, they use <clears throat> three concepts. Chronos, which is the name for the ordinary time, everyday time, uh, season, uh, stars, um, life. Um, and they have another concept, uh, Kairos. Kairos. And Kairos <coughs> means the um, opportunity, the right moment, the decisive moment, uh, the uh, yes, the instant you have to uh, to um, to do something at the right moment. Otherwise, <coughs> otherwise it doesn't it doesn't it <coughs> does not work. And the combat, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks combine Kronos and Kairos. And uh, regarding action, uh, a successful action is a combination of Kairos and Kronos. For example, to win a, uh, if you are a general, uh, to win a battle, you have to be uh, able to see the right moment to attack or to do something and to in so to speak to insert this moment in the audience the chronos so that the combination of the two uh, otherwise uh, you you don't succeed and they have <clears throat> A third concept, <clears throat> which is not directly temporal, but um, nevertheless it, it, it has a temporal dimension, which is crisis, crisis, uh, which means in Greek the judgment. And and uh, so the judgment is something which divide uh, something. If you have a before and after. And the judgment modified uh, radically what is uh, from then, before and after. And the, the crisis uh, in this temp temporal dimension was used um, especially by the physicians, the Hippocratic physicians. Okay, uh, the interesting thing is that the three concepts were used <clears throat> by the translators of the Bible, the translator of the Bible in Greek, the, the 70s, the 70, in Alexandria in the third century BC. And that's very important because they use these Greek concepts in order to translate the main Greek, the main Hebraic uh, concept of time for for presenting time and and the still more interesting thing is that the first christians the first christians uh, used the three concepts in the new testament in order to organize uh, to build the, what is going to become, after a few centuries, the Christian time. And uh, the Christian time uh, so is organized between the three concepts. You have crisis, which means, which define the end, the judgment, the final judgment and precede, just precede by the apocalypse. Okay, so crisis that the end and the apocalypse, apocalypse and judgment. Chronos, 
remains Kronos, the ordinary time. But Kairos uh, receives a, speci a special meaning, <coughs> that is incarnation. Though Kairos became, in a way, uh, the main concept, because it defined with the incarnation the beginning of a radically new time. And the Christian time, what I call the Christian regime of historicity, the Christian time um, is the time between the two limits of incarnation on one side and crisis on the other side. And in between, what you have <coughs> for the first Christians, for the first Christians, is present, is a present, without any mm, importance in a way. It has no, it's not a substantial time. That's simply the time between the incarnation and the end. And as you know, the first question were uh, thinking that the, the judgment will come very soon. So my definition of the, of the Christian time, of the Christian regime of historicity, is a, an apocalyptic, one apoc apocalyptic presentism. Presentism because in a way you have only the present, but the end is uh, 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 cannot happen without apocalypse. Okay. And, and um, so that was, and I think that is this uh, pattern is the very much the very pattern of the Western time. Um, even when Kronos, in a way, with the modern time, escape from the limitations of Kairos and Crisis, but Kairos and Crisis remains nevertheless active in the in the modern time. Of course, that's part of the book. I'm not going to um, going into that trial now. But um, uh, the interesting thing is that. Uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, I was interested by the confrontation between the Christian presentism and the contemporary presentism, which are not the same at all. But uh, so you we can have different presentism. They are not the same at all, except that. In our present present situation now, uh, with this uh, uh, possibility of an end uh, with the Anthropocene and this new time, um, an end not of the not of the Earth, uh, not of the time of the Earth, but an end of the of the human species and uh, the sixth extinction of species in a few <clears throat> in a few centuries. That means that we are introducing, because of what we have done, we are introducing a new limit some kind equivalent to, not the same, but equivalent to the uh, crisis, uh, apocalypse and judgment. And for the Christian, for the first Christians, this perspective meant that with the beginning of the new time incarnation, you enter also in the not the end of time, but the the time of the end. 
and that was very present, very active, very obvious for the first Christians. We are entering in the, the oldness of the world, they said, for example, that's what uh, Augustine, St. Augustine said that. So, as uh, the thing which interests me, can, uh, which can be um, confronted with our today uh, situation, is that as soon as you uh, have the possibility of a limit and some kind of end, you enter in a new time, which is the time of the end. And <clears throat> today, um, you have, we have, we are experiencing something like that. And it's, e it's easier, it's easy to understand why you have so many people who are uh, uh, developing some kind of uh, apocalyptic uh, presentation of apocalyptic moods or uh, catastrophic uh, uh, catastrophic predictions or I mean all this um, turmoil or this uh, um, uh, activities or or uh, is quite understandable if you look at this new configuration, confronting it, comparing it, it to what was uh, with the Christian conjuncture, the first first Christian conjuncture. So that's part of the of the aim of the book. Okay. Uh, before you go, I just I would like to uh, repass to you some messages of the public. Mm. For example, uh, they are saying to us good afternoon. Um, okay. yeah. People from many parts of Brazil, for example, and I Themistocles says. Saying good afternoon to us, and I say thank you to all of them we, which are here hearing. Uh, Fernando Honorato, good afternoon. Thank you for the op opportunity. Yeah, to... I, can, I can read it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Victoria, mm. Pedro. Some message that we received here, and well, to finish, I would like to. I'm glad to receive you here to talk with you. Um, thank you very much, and well, that's it. Thank you, thank you to you, and um, good uh, good evening. Good evening, good afternoon, and well, for the people who will watch us later, for them, good morning, good afternoon. Good morning, good morning too. <laughs> ciao, ciao, okay. bye bye. Thank ciao, you. Ciao, ciao, bye bye.